These days, Marvel's catalog of caped content is expanding by the month, and it's getting hard to tell what's a sequel and what's not. With the ever-growing connected universe that started with Jon Favreau's Iron Man in 2008, and has continued most recently with Loki Season 2. And while the well of Marvel movies never seems to dry up, there was a time where we were lucky to get one MCU project per year. Of course, with the box office explosion that Iron Man caused, and the healthy $100 million profit that Edward Norton's take on The Incredible Hulk saw, it seemed inevitable that Kevin Feige and the folks at Marvel would be eager to follow up their original success with 2010's Iron Man 2. Uh, you're welcome, For I what? guess. Because I'm your nuclear deterrent. Robert Downey Jr.'s run as Tony Stark will go down in history as one of the single most inspired casting choices that Marvel has ever made. It was quite a gamble putting the MCU's first film in the hands of a post-scandal Hollywood talent like Downey, and if you ask me, that gamble paid off in spades. Downey's salary for the first film was only $500,000, but after the outstanding reception that Iron Man received, he was offered $10 million to return for the highly anticipated sequel. And who knows how much he's been paid to appear as the Flying Tin Man since this movie. Jesus. Wow. Look at that. That's modern art. That's going up. And also returning is the always reliable Jon Favreau as the film's director. They're kind of like the original Avengers behind the camera. So strap yourselves in tight, true believers. Today, we're gonna revisit the very first MCU official sequel and see how it stacks up against the standards of today's superhero movies. So let's grab some donuts or a couple of drinks and hit play on Iron Man 2. Now it's your, whatever happens the next 20 minutes, just go with it. Go with it, go like Mr. That. Stark? Hey. Iron Man 2 follows Tony Stark shortly after revealing his identity as Iron Man to the public. He's been dodging responsibility and mostly avoiding the inevitable consequences of owning such a powerful suit, including being pursued by the government, slimy industry rivals, and an angry Russian named Ivan Vanko who has his sights set on destroying the Iron Man to avenge his father. Don't get too attached to things. Learn to let go. Along the way, we get some new character introductions and some incredibly delicious performances as Tony battles the dark side of being a famous superhero. For most of the MCU, having a secret identity is kind of a joke. Like, the world knows that Steve Rogers is Captain America. Hell, he even has a musical named after his government name. The world knows that Thor is Thor, and I'm sorry, nobody's buying that disguise, buddy. I think one of the only main MCU characters to have a secret identity is Peter Parker, and he had to learn the hard way why having a secret identity is so important. But this movie really plays on the idea that Tony being out as Iron Man puts himself and everyone he loves in immediate danger, and how that idea can affect one's ability to stay the hero. I lost both the kids in the divorce. <laughs> The movie picks up shortly after the events of the first movie, and we're first introduced to Ivan Vanko. Ivan is played by the legendary Mickey Rourke, who portrays the character as an underground genius with the knowledge and intellectual prowess to rival even the brilliant Tony Stark. Ivan hates Tony, as we learn that Ivan's father and Tony's father were once partners before Howard Stark had Ivan's father deported. Think of it as revenge, but with a more complex motive. Hey. Yes. I want my board. Rourke's performance definitely is interesting in this movie. I remember being lukewarm on it the first time I saw this film in 2010, but I've since grown to really appreciate the slightly goofy yet always intimidating performance that he gave. It's nice to see the villains of this movie really getting some thought. Venko uses his scientific engineering know-how to build a weapon that is strong enough to incapacitate Tony, a set of whips powered by an arc reactor similar to Tony's. When we check in with Tony, he's living the high life as Iron Man doing appearances at his famed Stark Expo, which has since become the canonical first appearance of Peter Parker in the MCU. When Tom Holland pitched the idea that he would be this kid, Feige decided to confirm it as canon, so neat. Yes, it's very cool. 
The government is also after Tony, as they want to have control over the Iron Man technology, a technology that we all know Tony built in a cave. With a box of scraps! And Tony is claiming that he's the only person who knows how to make the technology, and therefore sees no need to hand over his suits. Although we also learn that the arc reactor Tony is using to power his suit is simultaneously killing him from the inside. It almost feels like there's a lot of plot lines to follow in this movie, but they all blend together so seamlessly that this movie's two hour runtime feels pretty snappy. I actually think story wise, this is a very interesting sequel. Speaking of improved from the first film to the second, the Iron Man action and suit design is absolutely wonderful here. We see the same level of impressive CGI effects and still have that early MCU tangible looking Iron Man suit that we all love so much. In fact, that extends to the War Machine suit as well, which makes its official debut in this movie. Hey, wait a minute, that's not Terrence Howard. Look, it's me, I'm here, deal with it, let's move on. I just, I just drop, drop it. it. All right. So, here's the deal. Tony is denying the government access to his toys, and Rhodey has been tasked with keeping a close eye on Tony to try to get his best friend to come around and sign over the Iron Man tech to the military. Tony is not interested, but then again, he's dying and slowly losing his ability to care about anything. If this was your last birthday party you're ever going to have, how would you celebrate it? The movie is laying some groundwork for the classic demon in a bottle comic book arc that is loosely adapted into the third film, and the primary focus of that story in the comics is Tony battling his addiction to alcohol. In this movie, there's definitely some of that brewing up, as well as Tony falling apart knowing that the suit he created to keep him alive is slowly destroying his body. When Vanko shows up on a racetrack to get the jump on Tony, we get introduced to one of my top three favorite moments in the MCU Phase 1. Ivan almost gets the best of Tony, but he loses the fight. However, he did accomplish what he wanted to. He proved to the world that Tony isn't the only one with the technology to build the suit. And this is where I need to talk about the movie's second villain, Justin Hammer. I want to go to that Stark Expo, I want to take a dump in Tony's front yard, you know what I'm talking about? Sam Rockwell plays basically the evil version of Tony Stark, and this is one of the greatest villains that the MCU has ever introduced. I swear to God, this guy should be brought back immediately. Justin Hammer is one of those villains that desperately wants to be Tony's rival. He tries as hard as possible to be a suitable nemesis, and the only thing that makes him a villain is that he just wants to dethrone the Stark legacy and be the bigger figure of American defense. Tony and I, Tony, I love Tony Stark. Tony loves me. We're not competitors. He and Mickey Rourke were great in their scenes together, and I honestly think that Rockwell's performance in this movie is all time for the MCU. It's hilarious, believable, yet hammy. It's just glorious. Hashtag hammer forever. So the plan is for Hammer to fund and source Vanko's development of their own bootleg Iron Man suits. If Hammer can manufacture the tech, he'll be able to sell it to the military and thus beat Tony at a game that Tony doesn't even want to play. There also is what I consider to be the best scene in the entire movie where Hammer is doing a weapons demo for the military and that has to say something. Rockwell absolutely steals the show with this scene. The torso taker, powder maker, a boy's uniform call it Uncle Gaspacho or Puff the Magic Dragon. Now, while Whiplash and Hammer are tinkering with their toys, Tony and Stark Industries are up against a wall. Tony handed the company over to Pepper, and now he's just looking to find a cure for his worsening condition before it's too late. If there's one part of this movie that I didn't appreciate enough the first time I saw it, it's the emotional arc that Tony has when Nick Fury gives Tony a locker filled with information that his late father left behind. Within that locker is the answer that Tony needs to cure himself. It's nice to see that sweet moment Tony has watching his dad's old tapes, though. It adds a little something extra to this movie and the overall MCU. My greatest creation is you. 
There's a solid amount of characters introduced in this film as well. We get the intro to Black Widow, with Scarlett Johansson making her debut as the character, and she's undercover for S.H.I.E.L.D. as one of Tony's lawyers, and it's a pretty solid way to get another hero into the mix. You're fired. That's not up to you. We also get a good amount of Nick Fury in this movie, and I love how Samuel L. Jackson plays the character in the early years. He's so damn smooth in this movie, and his acting chops are sharp as ever. You're Iron Man, and he just took it? The little brother walked in there, kicked your ass, and took your suit. But wait, the most important character introduction comes in the form of the best Avenger of all time, Phil Coulson. I will tase you and watch Super Nanny while you drool into the carpet, okay? I think I got it, yeah. Technically, we see him in the last movie, but he's just amazing here. We also get the co-opted Peter Parker introduction and a post credit scene teasing a new Avenger, but we'll get to that later. So, Tony is able to cure himself using the information that Fury and Howard Stark provided him, and he's running Iron Man 2.0 just in time to stop Justin Hammer from debuting his new Iron Man drones to the public. See, Ivan Vanko was working with Hammer to build the drones, but he had his own plans. He rigged the drones to attack on command, and thanks to Tony and Rhodey, it's gonna be a difficult night for our big baddies. The reintroduction to the official War Machine suit is so good in this movie. I enjoy War Machine in the comics, and I really was looking forward to seeing the tease from the first film pay off in this movie, and I was not disappointed. I love Don Cheadle, and I'm happy he's War Machine, but I think he's never been more badass than he is in this final battle. Like, please just make Iron Wars and make him look and do stuff like this. Tony and Rhodey defeat the drones and Whiplash, and this is a really somber way to end the movie if you ask me. In a lot of ways, both villains were mirrored characters of Tony Stark. Justin Hammer was the mirror of Tony, and Vanko was the mirror of Iron Man. And Vanko, like Tony, wanted to finish his father's work. So there's a very complicated and emotionally satisfied feeling that comes from seeing Ivan blow himself up. But also, the action and CGI look so beautiful in this final showdown that I quickly got over the sadness and just got back to the edge of my seat. And in the end, Hammer is arrested, Vanko is dead, and Justice prevailed. But just before we left the theater, the movies gave us one final scene. A scene that teased the introduction of Thor, when Agent Phil Coulson arrives at a dig site where S.H.I.E.L.D. has just discovered his hammer. So, in the end, I love this movie. I love the look of it, I love the analog sounding sound design, the rich color palette, the performances, it's all there, and it is all a fun time at the movies. There's a very light tone to this movie, but the music beautifully creates moments of intense emotion. Whether it's the excitement when we hear ACDC in Tony's intro, or the swelling score we hear when Tony finds out he's dying. It's thoughtful, and I love that. The film opened in theaters on May 7th, 2010, and was greeted by an amazing $624 million box office run. The movie was a certified hit in sales, and the same can be said for the movie's critical reception. Critics agreed that the movie was a suitable sequel to the first film, with Roger Ebert saying, Iron Man 2 is a polished, high-octane sequel. Not as good as the original, but building once again on a quirky performance by Robert Downey Jr. Reviews like this may not seem to be glowing, but with this movie's release, Hollywood would officially be changed forever. See, after this movie, Marvel Studios was officially in talks to be acquired by none other than the House of Mouse. For me, Iron Man 2 is an entertaining movie with sharp writing, fun characters, and top-notch special effects that make for one of the MCU's best sequel films. I think in general, if you love Iron Man in the MCU, you're probably at least a little bit into this movie, and if you ask me, it's a movie well worth the rewatch if you've been considering it. I like you. I got you the bird. I'm... You said no problem. 